Last week, we finished our study through 2 Timothy, where we focused on the theme of being not ashamed of the gospel, being bold for Christ. Today, we're starting a new series. We've titled it, When Love Disagrees. When Love Disagrees. And normally, we don't connect messages series very often. Each message series tends to stand alone, but these two are connected, and and here's how they're connected. It is easy, relatively, to talk about being bold for Christ at church. It's easy to talk about being not ashamed of the gospel in our small groups. It's an entirely different thing to show up at work and discover that the new colleague that we have has, is moving into her office and she's hanging this poster on the wall. Science is real. Black lives matter. No human is illegal. Love is love. Women's rights are human rights. Kindness is everything. What do you think she thinks about evangelical Christians? Some of you are high school students. You're going to be, you're applying right now to colleges. How will you feel if you get to college this fall and you come into your dorm room to find that your new roommate you've never met has that poster on the wall? You're going to be excited to be bold and excited to invite him or her to join you at the welcome event at the college Christian ministry that week? Being bold for Christ, and this is the subject that we're going to be diving into for the next four weeks. Being bold for Christ means, at times, stepping into disagreement with people. It's kind of part of the journey. But here's the truth. Some topics create more disagreement than others. Some topics, whoo, some of the topics that come to mind as I read that poster make me think about the topics that might create more disagreement than others. I, wonder, I, suspect, I suspect talking to this woman about abortion would lead to some pretty clear and significant disagreement between where she is and where I am. I suspect that. Abortion's a charged topic, isn't it? in our nation these days in the, in the wake of the repeal by the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. I suspect this woman and I would disagree on other hot topics. I suspect we disagree on the subject of sex and marriage. Hot topic these days. And I know, this is the one thing I know about where she is, I know she and I would disagree on the subject of gender. I'll tell you how I know that later. See, right now in America, the topics of abortion, of sex and, and, and marriage, of gender, they, they are topics that are generating some of the hottest and quickest disagreement between those who hold a biblical worldview and those who don't. We see that every day in our news feeds, right? Every day our, new, our news feeds have reports of the disagreement on those issues between followers of Jesus and those who don't share our belief that the Bible is God's inerrant and infallible truth. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be, we're going to talk about these issues. So you're going to need to come back, okay? Because I'll know if you don't. We're going, to talk about the, we're going to talk about abortion. We're going to talk about sex and marriage. We're going to talk about gender. We're going to talk about these hot button issues for two reasons. We're going to talk about them first because we need to see what God says about them. We're hearing a lot from our culture these days. We're going to talk about them together because we need to first see what God says about them. Because unless we ground our thinking in God's word, we're going to end up thinking like the world does. And the second reason we're going to talk about these issues is to learn how to have gospel conversations, not arguments. 
both about these issues, but really about any issue that we would end up disagreeing. So some of you have parents, some of you parents, you know, you've got the sick, the fifth graders with you. They can't go to adventure land and you're like, whoa, whoa. Uh oh, you know, you're covering, you're putting the ear, you're putting the AirPods in right now. You don't need to do that, okay? Today, we're not going to dive into those conversations today. We're going to be doing that the next three weeks. But here's what you need to know, parents. You do need to, we're going to keep it PG 13, but you need to know that, that the next three weeks, the sermons are going to need some parental guidance. And that's by design. Because if our kids, aren't learning about these issues from from their parents and from their church family. They're going to then learn about them from school and from media, and God's truth is not well represented from either of those sources. So we aren't jumping into those issues today. Today is kind of the setup for them. We're not jumping into them today because there's something that we need to do first. Before we dig into specific hot topics of disagreement between scripture and culture, we need to talk, we need to talk about, about when Christ followers should disagree. We need to talk about why Christ followers should disagree. And we certainly need to talk about how followers of Jesus should disagree. So that's our focus today. Why, when, and how should we disagree? And our key verse is found in Ephesians. We're going to really anchor in just this one verse today. I encourage you this week to be reading the context of that passage. It's really rich. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on one verse, Ephesians 4, 15, where Paul says this. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love... We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. See, this verse tells us that when we become followers of Jesus, we start this lifelong journey of spiritual growth. Growth to, to do what? To become like Jesus. When we come to know Jesus, we start a lifelong journey. It better never end because we'll never fully get there, right? A lifelong journey to become like Jesus. And Paul tells us here in Ephesians 4.15 that that journey of spiritual growth always includes something. It always includes speaking truth in love. We can't grow in Christ if we don't grow in our ability to speak truth in love. That's what Jesus did. We've got four gospels that record Jesus' life. And page after page, what do we see Jesus doing? Speaking God's truth in love. It's what he did. Jesus' entire ministry was speaking God's truth in love. And what happened as he did that? Well, quite often, he found himself in disagreement with people, with the culture. In fact, Jesus was in disagreement a lot of the time. But here's what we see. Every disagreement that Jesus had was a disagreement over God's truth because of God's love. Every disagreement that Jesus had was a disagreement over God's truth because of God's love. So here's the big idea for today, and it really is going to stretch over all of the next three weeks as well. When God's love requires that we disagree, his love must oversee how we disagree. When God's love requires that we disagree, and it does at times, His love must oversee how we disagree. Family, gospel disagreement is always about God's love, always. If it's not, it's not the gospel. We might be disagreeing, but it's not good news. Family, if you and I are gonna disagree like Jesus and that's how we need to take, that's where we need to take our example. If we're gonna disagree like Jesus, it, 
it always needs to be all about God's love. We don't disagree unless God's love requires us to disagree. And when it does, God's love needs to oversee how we disagree. So how do we know when God's love requires that we disagree? The answer to that is in the truth side of our key verse. Speak the truth in love. The Bible has a lot to say about truth. I want to focus on three things it says. First, the Bible says this about truth. It says we must know it. We got to know it. One of the times that Jesus directly links love of God with truth is in John 14, 15, where he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, we can't keep commandments if we don't know them. Here's a question that we need to regularly ask ourselves. Do we love God's truth? Do you love God's truth? If you love it, if we love it, we'll know it. We'll get to know it. You know, I talk to people quite regularly who who are convinced they love God's truth. They love God's word. But as I enter into conversations, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly, they don't know much about it. And if they're just new to Christianity, that's expected. They're on a good trajectory. But if they've known Christ for some years... I think they're confusing love with, I don't know what, but it's not love. Love will dig in. Love will grow in knowledge of God's truth. Because if, if you really love God's truth, you're going to want to get to know more than the executive summary, right? The first page, the cliff notes. If you love God's truth, you're going to dig in to learn not only what God says, but get this, why he says it. Those are different things. It is a lot easier to get to know the executive summary, the cliff notes of what God says than it is to get to understand truly the why, God's heart behind what he says. And knowing why God says something is absolutely critical. Family, people rarely change their thinking when we tell them, what God says about how to live. We need to explain why God's plan is the best. And to do that, we need, we need to know more than the Bible's cliff notes. We need to love and know God's truth. Well, secondly, we need to obey God's truth. Moral hypocrisy destroys gospel witness. We know this to be true. There's a reason, a great reason, that God tells us to look first at our own lives before pointing out the error in others. In John 8, 32, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, you will know the truth, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If we know the truth, we'll obey the truth. Because when Jesus says the truth will set you free, he's talking about being set free from sin, from going our own way, from living outside of God's plan is truth. So here's another great question we should be asking ourselves. Is God's truth freeing us from sin today? Do we have fresh stories of God freeing us from sin. Family, if we're gonna step into gospel disagreement, we have got to have a heart attitude like David expressed in Psalm 139, 23, where he writes, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, set me free. Is that the genuine attitude of your heart today? Is God leading you in the way everlasting as you learn his truth and then change your life because of it? Do you have fresh stories of God convicting you of sin and you changing 
the direction of your life as a result. Family, if not, if you don't have that going on, you might not be, you probably aren't in a good place to enter into gospel disagreement. No matter how much you know about God's word, God's truth, because moral hypocrisy destroys gospel witness. We don't need to be perfect at all. We'll never be perfect. But family, we need to have a heart of obedience if we're gonna step into gospel disagreement and, and be someone that God can use to change the heart of someone else. Well, third thing about truth, the Bible says it over and over again, and it said it in our key verse, we must share it. We must share it. When we know and obey God's truth, we're called to share it. It's not optional. Paul says that growing spiritually, there in Ephesians 15, growing spiritually requires speaking the truth, sharing it with others. The apostle Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Talking about spiritual growth. Doing what? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. We must share God's truth. So back to our question, when should we step into gospel disagreement? Should we run into every opportunity that we have? Nah, that's not probably wise. Here's, here's kind of how I would answer that question, looking at everything the Bible has to say on that subject. When we see someone living out of alignment with God's plan, when we can share God's truth with personal integrity, and when God gives us opportunity, then we should risk disagreement for the gospel's sake. Now, there's a lot packed into that answer. You might want to screenshot that one. I didn't get time to put that into the sermon notes. When we know God's truth well enough to see someone is out of alignment and understand why God's plan is better, when we know God's truth that well, when we're obeying God's truth ourselves, we've got personal integrity, not hypocrisy, and when we believe God's given us opportunity, that's when we should take the risk of disagreement and share God's truth with them. That's when we should disagree. But what about why? Why should we take that risk? Well, answering that question gets us from the truth side of our key verse over to the love side. We looked at three things the Bible says about truth. Let's look at three things it says about love. Why do we risk gospel disagreement with people? We disagree from love. Love is why, family, don't don't miss this. This is kind of the center of today. Love is why we disagree. For many years, I got Ephesians 4.15 backwards. I thought speaking the truth in love was mostly about truth. It's not. Speaking the truth in love is mostly about love. The Greek word for love that Paul uses here is the word agape, and it's a type of love the Greeks had a word for it that was the sacrificial love. Where, where we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for the benefit of the one loved. See, for many years, I, I had the call to speak the truth in love backwards. I thought it was God's truth that required me to disagree. It's not. God's truth stands on its own merit. God doesn't need me to defend it. It's God's bottomless, never-ending love for people that requires me to speak truth, even when it risks disagreement. Because in some way that makes no sense to me, God has has invited me to join him in his love for people and out of love to share his truth. This is tremendously important for us to understand. The reason why we risk gospel disagreement with people is because God loves them and he calls us to love them. That's the only reason. It's the only reason. 
We risk gospel disagreement because as Christians, we have a duty to aid. God's opened our eyes to truth, and because of him, we, we, we now know his plan and path to life. We know that all other paths to, are perilous for people. So we have a duty to aid. God's love won't let us stay silent and watch people that God's put in our lives walk into ruin. We have a duty to aid. Why do we disagree? Family, we always and only disagree from love. What about the how? We've talked about the when we disagree, the why we disagree. What about the how? Because that's where it gets tricky in a lot of times. Actually, it's all kind of tricky, to be honest. How do we disagree? We disagree in love. We disagree from love, and we disagree in love. You know, it's interesting. Disagree, love, not words we typically associate with each other, are they? They conjure up, they bring to mind, they evoke very different emotions. Disagreement brings to mind negative emotions like tension and anger. So what does it mean to disagree in love? Let's go back to the the image of the woman with the poster. I was going to tell you a bit more about her. Her name is Sive Gallagher. Sive Gallagher, she's a plastic surgeon up in Miami, has a practice in Miami. And this picture here was published in the New York Times about four months ago, published for a New York Times article with the head, the headline of the article was this, more trans teens are choosing top surgery. That's a term for for surgery to change a person's chest to look like the opposite gender. And Dr. Gallagher does a lot of these. She performs about 500 top surgeries a year, and a number of them she performs on teenagers as young as 13. Now, Dr. Gallagher's earned nationwide attention, let's just say, because not only because of her practice, but because she aggressively markets. She's one of the only surgeons to do this. She aggressively markets her surgeries on social media where teenagers hang out. Kind of a target market for her. I got to tell you, reading this article, it made me angry. The thought of surgically altering teenagers to look like the opposite gender I mean, it's horrifying to me. When it it comes to gospel disagreement, I couldn't disagree more strongly. So back to our question, how do I disagree with Dr. Gallagher in love? Is that even possible? Well, God says it is. And like so often, he uses the Apostle Paul, in my case, to show me that. You know, the Apostle Paul was no stranger to gospel disagreement. He'd forgotten more about it than I hope to ever know. His disagreements, Paul's disagreements over God's truth had resulted in him being stoned, him being beaten, him being imprisoned, threatened with death. Paul had very good reasons to be a pretty angry, disagreeing Christian, but he wasn't. One of the most remarkable statements Paul makes, I think in some ways, is in Philippians 3.18. He writes this, for many of whom I've often told you and, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul had many more reasons to be an angry Christian than I do. Enemies of the cross of Christ, enemies of God's truth had caused him great harm, but but was Paul angry with them? No. Paul cried over them. Church family, 
You and I should never bring the challenge of God's truth without tears in our eyes. Because if we do, we're not, we're not disagreeing in love. What do I mean by saying we should never bring the challenge of God's truth without tears in our eyes? I mean this. We should not bring the challenge of God's truth without having the heart and attitude of Paul. Paul was passionately committed to sharing God's truth, but his motivation was always love, God's love. See, Paul's motivation was love informed by God's truth. Because Paul knew God's truth, he knew how badly the enemies of the cross needed to discover God's love. So Paul boldly shared the truth and risked disagreement with tears in his eyes because of his commitment to God's love. Family, we must always and only disagree in God's love because then and only then will will we be able to disagree with love. What does it look like to disagree with love? That's a big question, one we certainly can't fully cover today. We're gonna talk about how to disagree with love quite a bit the next three weeks as we dig into these hot issues. For today, I just wanna highlight two principles from scripture that always apply to how we disagree with love. First, disagreeing with love is is always about winning hearts, not arguments. We talked about this in 2 Timothy. The Bible says it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance, to change. Family, truth doesn't win hearts. It can win a mind, maybe. Truth doesn't win hearts. Kindness does. Many years ago, my good friend and fellow elder, Les Anderson, gave me this advice. I've used it ever since. I'll give it to you. It's useful in so many times in life, so many disagreements. He says, Scott, before you bring challenge to someone, ask yourself these three questions. Is it true? Is the challenge going to be true? Does it line up with God's truth? Is it necessary? Has God given you an opportunity that you feel you need to step into? Is it true? Is it necessary? And then thirdly, is it kind? That's, those are helpful questions to be asking in the context of any gospel disagreement. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Family, the only objective in gospel disagreement is to win hearts through kindness. Why? So that a changed heart will come into alignment with God's plan for life. But as I think about Dr. Gallagher, I'm reminded of how easy it is, especially if I don't know the person personally, to not to see them as a person, to essentially dehumanize, even demonize enemies of the cross of Christ. We can't bring kindness to people. We dehumanize and we demonize. Disagreeing in love, with love, requires us to humanize, not demonize. We have to work to see them not as opponents or threats, but as people, people that God loves. One of the most helpful things for me to do that is to remember that on the other side of this gospel disagreement is a person who often truly believes that they're operating out of love as well. Think about the statements on that poster. Love is love. Kindness is everything. I doubt I'll ever meet Dr. Gallagher. But I suspect if I sat with her today and talked with her, I would discover a person who truly believes that she is extending love to her patients. She needs God's truth. She needs God's truth. But she's not likely to find it 
except for the path of kindness that leads to repentance. Kindness, that poster's right. Kindness is everything if it's taking us to God's truth. Well, we've covered a lot of kind of concepts in a pretty short period of time. (laughs) Hope you're all still kind of with me. But I want to close by just kind of using a couple of props and illustration here that I've had in mind as I think about bringing truth, speaking truth in love. I've got here one of my favorite things. I try to keep these near. I've got them in my office. I got them in my house. I have several at my house. The Alaska Atlas. Who loves the Alaska Atlas? Come on. Come on, guys. Come on, ladies. There's, you know, almost every page has a place I'd like to hunt or fish. Just say, oh, yeah, Kodiak. I got to go back to Kodiak. So this, this map, this is a map. This map, I think, is a good illustration of God's truth, right? Because the Bible is ultimately our map, God's personally crafted map. He's, he's got every GPS coordinate we need. He's got every good fishing and hunting spot for life in his map. God's truth keeps us out of, the, out of all the places that are harmful, the risky places. It, it shows where all of the reefs are so we don't shipwreck. God's truth right here. Well, this is my wife's favorite fuzzy blanket. Uh, I didn't ask her permission today, so... She's coming to the next service. Maybe I'll get a different blanket. (laughs) This is her favorite fuzzy blanket. She spends a lot of time in this blanket. So when I think about bringing love, uh, this is a good representation. Now, here's the truth. All of us have a tendency to, to bring more of one or the other, right? To people that we love or that we're... Think about disagreement. In the context of gospel disagreement, we have a tendency to bring either bring more truth or more blanket. Sometimes it's different depending on who it is and who we're talking to. In, you know, me in the context of you know my friendship is it with my friends as a pastor. I tend to I tend to like bringing out the blanket, making sure people feel the love of God through me. With my sons, I'm like kind of all about the map. It's like, come on, boys. I gave you the map. I raised you in the map. I've taught you the map. Why aren't you following the stinking map? I tend to bring the map with my sons. Uh, probably need to bring more blanket. And probably as with my friends and some of the people that God gives me a chance to, 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 to be with here in the context of being a pastor, probably need to bring some more map. Because here's the truth. We, don't, we aren't called to speak truth. We aren't called to, to bring love. We're called to speak truth in love. It takes both. And this calibration b- makes every gospel disagreement unique. And if we're not asking the Holy Spirit to help us know what to bring, we're gonna mess it up. So often I get asked by people questions that are this, a tough question of this, I, I, Here's a recent one that we got asked. I didn't get asked, but another pastor did. And he asked my advice. Like, Holy cow. It was a mother who said, my adult son is having surgery to transition into being a woman, surgically. Lives out of state by himself and really wants me to come down and be with him. If somebody has to be with him as he recovers, do I go? If you don't have the Holy Spirit helping you without challenge, we're likely to make the wrong decision so much of the time. We're called to bring the truth boldly, to not be afraid to step into gospel disagreement. We must out of love. And the first thing hopefully people would feel from us is the blanket. They're much more likely to open the pages of the map if the blanket's kind of around their shoulders. Now, this metaphor can be used lots of different ways. You know, my kids have, you know, they've had a lot of blankets, so it's time for, you know, you get my point. God help us, family. 
God help us to give us, to give us the courage and the wisdom for how to bring his truth and his love to a world that so desperately needs it. Pray with me. Father, we need you. I just think back to so many of the conversations I've had that I would kind of put under the label of gospel disagreement and how often thinking back, I didn't lean into you nearly enough, kind of relied on my confidence, my opinions. Father, would you help me? Would you help all of us be people who are quick every day to first and foremost pray what David prayed, Psalm 139, that you'd search me, you'd, you'd try me, you'd try my thoughts, you'd show me where they're wrong, lead me into your life. Because as I have that hard attitude, as we have that hard attitude, we'll be positioned to, to be led by your Holy Spirit in truth, with love, into the people in our lives that you've called us to be your ambassador, your little Christ. We need you, Father. And so we ask boldly in Jesus' name that you do that. Amen. Let it be. Well, my pastor's challenge today is exactly that, that, that each day this week you would read and Read it as a prayer, a genuine prayer, Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me and know me, try me. See if there's anything in me that needs to change, God, and lead me, lead me in your truth. That's my challenge, family. You up for it this week? Hey, come back next week because we got some talking to do for our good, for God's glory.